a lot of those people who came back and talked to my year and I've gone back and talked to future years as well at that course and you know I was really really lucky because I just scraped in we was there were still government grants to do university so you know even the MSC I was grant funded to do it so as long as I had a cheap rent and I did live in a pretty seedy place in North London I could actually afford to live off lentils in, in that seedy place and do an MSC without incurring a huge debt it was amazing so I afterwards was then doing various temping jobs I walked into London Wildlife Trust office right near um I tell you what, it was a bit more seedy then in King's Cross, so just on York Way. And I said, do you want to volunteer? And they said, yes, love, that's great. And put me in a room and I stuffed envelopes for a few weeks. And then someone came in and said, you know, well, what have you done? And I said, and they said, would you want to have a look through this report I'm writing and, you know, check it for typos or whatever. And then so gradually I got to you know, do some more interesting stuff there and then just kept five jobs until I got my first job. From Coordinate Sports, it's the drive phase. A show about sports founders, leaders and experts and the stories behind their business journeys. Our guest this episode is Stephanie Hillborn, CEO of Women in Sports. Stephanie is a seasoned leader, having been CEO of the Wildlife Trust and is an advocate for females across all stages of their lives in sports. During the episode, we talk through Stephanie's career in sustainability and conservation, how she was brought up with a strong understanding sport and great role models taught resilience, focus and hard work. We also debate how to keep girls engaged in sport and how women in sport tackles the obvious as well as the invisible barriers that work to push girls and women away from sport. Enjoy the show. Okay, so really excited to have Stephanie Hillborn with us today. She's CEO of Women in Sports. The charity was established back in 1984 to tackle inequalities in the sports sector and going strong today. Stephanie, very warm welcome to the Drive Face podcast. Good to be with you today. You too. Generally, how we how we tend to start and just to give our listeners a little bit of background on, on yourself, get to know you a little bit better. So we normally t- take it back to the to beginning and talk about your childhood. So what would your, I guess, would you be able to tell us about your early life and how that, I guess, what you would, how you describe your childhood? Yeah, I had, a, I was really, really lucky as a kid. I'm, I'm Generation X. We were underparented which I think in many ways, some of us was great. So we ran wild. I grew up in a really nice part of the world where we could run into the woods and muck around. Had two older brothers, two boys up the road as well. So I basically hung around with four lads when I was growing up. And, you know, so it just felt like it was always outside, but I must have been inside sometime. My parents were kind of, my mom's a social worker. My, my dad was working in the civil service. He was, a, he was a scientist. And he was the one who was really into getting us to learn to play badminton or table tennis or stuff like that. So, so he was a Sporty one, wasn't he? Yeah, he well, he was sporty. He had really bad asthma when he was young, and he'd be like nearly 100 now, so they had no treatment for it. So he was very coordinated, but he couldn't run when he was a kid. So uh, he was really good at things like table tennis, but he never got into the, the big field sports. But he was just, he just expected us all to be able to do it equally. He didn't think I'd be, you know, any worse than my brothers and stuff like that. Like you kind of explaining um, or describing a bit of a like, countryside uh, environment that you grew up in. Was it a small town or village that you? You yeah, no, it was the suburbs really in a way. It was All in right. Surrey, in North Surrey. And um, so we weren't really part of a, a community. When I had my own kids, I wanted to be more part of a community where you could just walk around the corner to your friends. We were in Surrey, we were near some beautiful woods, but it, the houses were pretty spread out. And, uh, you know, it's a very, now it's, you know, it's now it's where all the Chelsea footballers live. But, you know, we were in a bungalow and, you know, we were quite privileged. It wasn't a small yeah. bungalow, but it wasn't sort of flash footballers mansion either. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so just in this sort of, kind of between place well, I was going to ask yeah because uh, when you describe it I was thinking about school and whether it was a kind of a small village school or I guess school life shapes you yeah the, it's funny I didn't mention school did I, I mean yeah the, so my primary school was was the local British school but you uh, had to walk a good like mile or so to get there so some of those people got dropped off there we didn't always walk there and then I was sent to private school and so the and the private school was like 20 minute drive and so there were buses that took you to day school and in fact the the secondary school I went to was just amazing at sport you know and that's one of the great inequalities isn't it it's like it was a private school they had great sports teachers loads of facilities and so I at school which is an all girls school sport was my total life and I just loved netball and I loved playing badminton and lacrosse I wasn't actually very good athlete I couldn't really run any speed at all if I wasn't chasing a ball but it was you know tennis whatever I turned my hand to it and when I was at school what I was doing was looking out the window the whole time to try and sort of get outside get out on the playing field yeah yeah, chuck a ball around whatever so yeah I mean school was really where 
sport really formed me at school I think particularly secondary school and and I ended up being school captain and you know sort of stuff and I had these really really great teachers at school in in sport should I say whereas I felt pretty misunderstood outside that if I'm honest so I was that like, was your expert yes you got sport as your expression kind of thing, yeah. yeah it was and that was where I seemed to be valued by the teachers and you kind of want that recognition and, and our research at women in sport shows actually you know that girls want that recognition as well they don't just want to be told to um to have fun they want to actually be doing something that feels like it's meaningful and I got just stacks of that from sport whereas I was generally not very focused in the classroom and then actually I hurt my back when I was playing badminton I got a bit unfit went for a crazy shot twisted my back right round and and that sort of took me out of a lot of sport I was doing and in fact looking back on it it wasn't that severe an injury but I think back injuries are pretty terrifying aren't they yeah so you um so I kind of suddenly thought what if I couldn't play sport and then I the frantic so a month or so up to my A levels, trying to work really hard so I could get good. <laughs> just um, cramming it all in. It was a proper cram, and and then I did. I, I did fine, but then sport kind of fell out. And because I'd lived outside, it was wildlife and the environment that I could see being destroyed around me because that was when they were building the M25 and UA3, and right. so all the places I'd grown up walking around in and just having this heavenly childhood and were going under tarmac, and that was just breaking my heart. And and I was reading books about climate change and and I became a proper eco-warrior during the same time as at school I was playing sport at home I was sort of thinking I want to be an eco-warrior oh, so, yeah. so that's why I went into environmental stuff and and that sort of was because you see what, I was going to say obviously career has been I guess mis- really mission driven I suppose and I was going to mention just I will go back to it but your experience in school probably when we talk about more about what women in sport do and the finding out researching do you think that environment with, with it being an all girls school and maybe a sporty school do you think that kind of was it positive for most people? Obviously, you were talented or you love sport, but how did that, was that the same for everyone who went to school at that time? Or do you think someone might have well, missed out or fell out if they weren't at sport? No, I think the same stuff happened to a lot of the girls at school. I've got back in touch with a whole massive group of people I never really was friends with <laughs> recently at school. I think when you hit 50, you start doing that sort of stuff. And a couple of us in that bigger group of 20 or so were really into sport and we keep reminiscing about it and the others keep putting up on the whatsapp group god i was crap at netball and i always felt useless because of it and i was bad at this and bad at so no it wasn't the same experience for for everyone and at the time if you're good at it and you're into it you don't notice people are feeling left out or that feeling judged about it or they're just you know feeling bad you know you yeah don't i guess it's hard that. to relate isn't it yeah because it I, probably the same as me i loved pe when p was around like do it explaining and I probably never thought about someone who did it if you didn't love PE and how that would make you feel if you had to go and whatever it would be get changed and go and play rugby outside in the cold and stuff really yeah there was always the old kid wasn't there you did feel for you know that one who really really absolutely was out on a limb yeah. and it was really kind of obvious but there's that whole group in between you, you probably just didn't register did you you know you just thought oh great I've been put to the team you go off and play exactly no but we're definitely going to get onto that but in terms of so education wise was it biology you went to went on to study obviously we've got the yeah, kind so of the bug for, to... for ecological change etc but you went into study biology yeah so look I'm 54 and when I went to university there were very few courses that were about the environment or ecology so I was saying I just want to be an environmentalist people were looking at me like I was mad and they said well maybe you should try and do something like biology so I went off to to Bristol University and studied biology and there was one really great lecturer and he was a man of very few words he was a very very quiet botanist but he was brilliant and he could tell I was just really passionate about conservation so he recommended I went to one of the at the time only two MSCs afterwards that were about conservation or environmental stuff so I went off and did this MSc in conservation and then went into the voluntary environment sector from there. Um, I'm, I'm assuming it was that in the UK. Because uh, nowadays you see you hear about people going away and maybe going to Australia or Barrier Reef or somewhere like that and, and studying for a year for the masters. But was it in the UK or it was, it was UCL? It was um, yeah, it was in London. I mean, the, the interesting thing for me as well, and I think this must be informed partly by having a social worker mother, is I always thought. Although I was really passionate environmentalist, I watched, watched all of David Attenborough's programmes and cared, you know, deeply about what was happening in every other part of the world, where, of course, actually the environments were far richer. I didn't feel that people like me should be going around the world telling other countries what to do, you know, telling other communities, cultures that they didn't understand what they should be doing. I felt that was just didn't feel right. I mm-hmm. felt if I was going to make a difference, I needed to do it here where I had a right to speak almost. 
And I guess especially um, if you're seeing it on your doorstep with like the building the M25 around <laughs> where you live. Yeah, I think two, two or three things were fueling me. One was David Attenborough, you know, and one was what was happening locally. And I knew I wanted to try and make a difference, but I genuinely felt I'd be more used in this country doing that. So in terms of straight out of university, was that when you joined the Wildlife Trust at that point or was it any stepping stones in between those? You've got, it seems yeah, like so you've got quite I'd a clear step- career path at the time. Oh, no, it wasn't really a career path. I mean, that's why when I was at school, you know, most of the people at my school were going off to do sort of accountancy or something, that, you know, law or, you know, marketing. There's a load of media marketing sort of types and they just looked at me like I was mad. So there was no sort of established career path as such doing this type of thing. In fact, the MSC I went to do at UCL had been formed in the 60s to try and get some form of career path into the government agencies that work on this. So there were jobs in it, but you weren't really aware of those jobs but because this MSC was one of only a few and because it had been formed for that reason what they did on it was they got a lot of people who'd gone through the MSC to come back and talk to us so all the way through that MSC we were hearing from people who got jobs in the environment sector you know people who are running Wild Up Trust or people who are running the RSPB or people who were in government working on this stuff and they were coming back and talking about what their jobs were so you got a real idea of what the machinery was like that was trying to improve the environment from that MSC, which was great. And I've got to know a lot of those people who came back and talked to my year. And I've gone back and talked to future years as well at that course. And, you know, I was really, really lucky because I just scraped in, we was, there was still government grants to do university. So, you know, even the MSC, I was grant funded to do it. So as long as I had a cheap rent and I did live in a pretty seedy place in North London, I could actually afford to live off lentils in, in that seedy place and do an MSC without incurring a huge debt. It was amazing. So I afterwards was then doing various temping jobs. I walked into London Wildlife Trust office right near, um, I tell you what, it was a bit more seedy then in King's Cross, so just on York Way. And I said, do you want to volunteer? And they said, yes, love, that's great. And put me in a room and I stuffed envelopes for a few weeks and then... Someone came in and said, you know, well, what have you done? And I said, and they said, would you want to have a look through this report I'm writing and check it for typos or whatever? And then so gradually I got to introduce some more interesting stuff there and then just kept five jobs until I got my first job. At the Wildlife Trust that you kind of rose up the ranks or was it a different organisation? Well, my one? first job, in fact, wasn't directly with the Wildlife Trust, although they were involved. My first job was in this kind of coordinating body called Wildlife and Countryside Link. Okay. which was set up by somebody who wanted to get the environment group. So Greenpeace, Friends of the Earth, RSPB, the Wildlife Trust, National Trust. So all the big guys together in a room and, and sort of make sure that they coordinated what they were saying into government more effectively. So there was just a tiny little outfit, about three people, and we were organising meetings with ministers that got all of those groups together, getting them to say, you know, helping them with the shared script in a sense, you know, making sure one of them wrote something down as what we're going to say, and then making sure the others didn't fight too much. So about everyone it. stays on message, right? Yeah, it was quite, it was very, very good way to understand what was going on and to see yeah. how government worked and then to see how those different charities operated and how they interface with each other. And, you know, there's things like whaling, you know, International Whaling Commission, and trying to get ban on whaling and, and the tactics of how, nobody disagreed with what we're trying to achieve, but the tactics of how you achieve that, you know, the absolute fury around the room about should you or shouldn't you um, have an Antarctic sector. Yeah, well, I was going to ask how, uh, would that be difficult to bring everyone together, obviously, because it's such a subject, everyone's going to be so passionate about it, but from their own perspective, right? So bringing everyone together must have been tough. Yeah, exactly. It, you know, it, was, it wasn't something I, as a sort of youngster, I could do on my own at all, but just understanding maybe seeing the people within the sector who could bring each other together and then helping them by just being highly efficient at capturing where they were agreeing and making sure they kind of all got on, on side with that. It was, you know, it was really interesting actually because the passion's so strong and uh, you know this is sort of people these these are people who were hanging off in you know, chains off massive russian well, not russian japanese whaling boats and stuff and you know they were pretty feisty characters so then when you were trying to agree what was going to go into our minister as to what he would say on the uk's behalf on the international community it got pretty intense <laughs> yeah, and then what so what was some of the i guess some of the highlights got back there because i know in terms of getting not law or acts passed in parliament things like that what was that experience like did you any big successes at that time yeah no i mean the, the interesting thing about environmental policy in a way is nobody disagrees it'd be a good thing to have you know a nice healthy clean environment with lots of wildlife in it but there's you know money is made by taking money out of the earth effectively you know you're just exploiting the natural resources constantly Mm. the land using the land you know growing our food and you know in the time in a very intense way 
And so you did need regulation, but we do as a society need regulation because it's, it's a common resource. So there were various pieces of legislation that have been passed, you know, over the 20th century, there were various pieces of legislation that have been passed. And, you know, so planning rules, for example, you know, so planning laws came in in the, I think the first one might be in the 30s, but post war was some really big sort of laws passed about what you have to do before you can build a house, you know, build thousands of houses. And then there were laws about pollution of the sea, of the rivers. And importantly, at the time as well, we were part of the EU, and there were some really big new laws coming in, directives at EU level. The Habitats Directive in particular was a really important law that meant that across the whole of the EU, really massively important, huge wetlands and river basins and things could be protected. And one of the countries said Lincoln, the people in it, were drawing up you know, basically proposals for laws in Europe that would then affect us. And then there was a, a big act in 2000, which was the Countryside and Rights, Rights of Way Act that was trying to improve the protection of wildlife habitats here and also grant access to people to use that land. So I was really involved in the early stages of that. And then ultimately later in my career, the last year's Environment Act, we were very involved in pushing for that. I don't want to skip over it entirely, but in terms of bringing that experience through to where we are today, so working with uh, women in sport and leading that organisation, what was, I guess, what was the spark that made you feel like, well, one, you were ready to kind of move move on, and, and two, that this was the right place for you? I think what I had realised during my time uh, dealing with the fat cats and industry and, you know, environment, you know, the guys running the huge aggregate companies or the water companies or whatever, was that I had built resilience through sport. You know, I had to be hugely resilient and we were losing a lot of the time. You're losing a hell of a lot more than you ever won anything. Mm. It, was, it was like being at the bottom of the table, you know, literally playing a far better team every day because, you know, it was so hard to achieve change. And, and I do remember really vividly, really bad points with, progress seeing my netball coach sort of imagining her at the side of the court when I was I was a defender in the end of netball and play I remember this one critical match national schools tournament we were in the light literally in the final of the finals and my opponent was like six foot three and I'm, I'm five ten right and not particularly good at jumping you know it was very good at anticipating it was a game. tough match then by sounds and I just remember her sort of at the sidelines you know and so um and I knew that that gave me a surprise in it so that's one thing second thing was in the last 10 years of my job at the World Trust, I've seen much more clearly what the gender inequalities were in society and within business. And then thirdly, I had um, watched, I've got a son and a daughter, and I've watched their comparative experience of sport growing up. So they're right. both really coordinated, both really naturally good at sport, but the provision was appalling at the school compared to the you know the luxury I'd had of having such good facilities and such good teachers and time for both of them and the the comparator between them was that there just wasn't the community team sport provision for my daughter though you know endless football teams my son joined and great and it was really good and he stayed playing till he was 18. My daughter was great at netball there was one great netball club but because there weren't adult women coaches they were the coaches were only a few years older than them they couldn't deal with all the sort of infighting and the girl behavior and it became my daughter didn't really like any of that you know so it became it's just so horrible she played county for a bit but it was just not a good even you know the county coaches are quite young it was just not the right environment for her so I just saw that inequality and even so much as it was in West Bridgeford Nottingham you know it was great that people didn't drive to school but the boys would cycle but the girls didn't cycle to school because the stupid clothes they're wearing so I had become oh, sort yeah. of sensitized to what the ongoing gender inequalities were what the inequalities economically were in terms of access to sport what the resilience meant in the workplace for me that I'd drawn from sport um, mm. and the skills and the leadership, the communication skills and everything else you learn in team sport. So when this job came up at Women in Sport, it was like, oh, that's my next thing. Because I kind of done, I felt I'd done what I could in the UK environment sector. So it's kind of calling to you at that time when, you, when it became apparent. Yeah. I, I'm really, I'm interested in that to, to maybe dig into a little bit more about the, the experience that like you said with your daughter and, and your son comparatively. What would you say is it obviously, like you said, there are a couple of examples, but is it more of a, well, including a um, maybe a different expectation of, of boys and girls in school and what they should, I don't know, what they should be getting in, involved in? Or does that make sense in terms of like just an underlying feeling, like you said, there with the maybe uniform and the cut, it's harder to be active if you have to wear a certain uniform school? Yeah, no, I mean, we know, I mean, we're doing a lot of research obviously now. And so some of this comes from what I've seen personally and some of it from my research, but the expectations, gender stereotyping starts kind of at birth, doesn't it? When the mm. midwife 
passes the baby across if you've got a father there and says oh it's a boy you'll be able to play football with him you know literally that's where it starts and if you never look back so you know that if you're about to send your kid to school and they're a boy and they don't know how to kick a ball you tend to make sure they do know how to kick a ball <laughs> whereas if it's a girl it's like well you'll be fine you, your job's to kind of look pretty and, and be a girl you know and so even before primary we know that physical literacy skills are lower in girls because there hasn't been that cultural expectation they must learn these basic skills you know yeah. around things like balls or running or you know whatever they're probably more like to run about but certainly ball skills stuff like that and then when they get to primary then the the wider gender stereotypes from teachers and other influences kick in and the playground gets dominated by the boys who get fed up with these girls who don't even know how to kick a ball and anyway they're trying to prove to their mates how great they are so you know the playground dynamic is a really negative factor even at primary but what we see is yeah then it plays through different ages and I think you know when you're a parent who's trying to actively give your daughter the same chances as your son and then you send them into the peer group or into the environment of the school where there isn't enough resource really to give any of the kids really good sort of PE experiences but certainly the sort of more informal side the boys are going to dominate you can see it's just not going to work for the girls at the moment and so this is in terms of the the, the organization it's probably a good time to look at kind of the origin story of that and this is going back to uh, 1984 was the launch is that correct and I would probably talk about distance traveled after that but what was the I guess the, the genesis of the organization getting started off the ground so women in sport well, there are particularly two women, Anita White, who was captain of the England hockey team, and Celia Brackenridge, who was an extraordinary campaigner, actually, for child protection and women's rights, who was the captain of the England lacrosse team at the time. And they came together with a few others, and I haven't got to understand their story so well. In the year, in fact, which was the first year that women were allowed to participate in the Olympic marathon, having wanted to since 1896, when the modern Olympics were founded and having started to almost campaign them because some women ran mm. the length of that then. So they started the charity at a time when we were really still in a pretty bleak place of kind of almost deliberate exclusion. Well, deliberate exclusion of women yeah. from certain sporting environments. And, you know, Anita says, you know, they she come back from an amazing international hockey tour and they would kind of won and that there was literally no coverage of it in, in the press at all, or there was one line somewhere. And she just felt a bit angry. And both of them were academics, extremely bright women. They, uh, they knew when they founded the charity, they needed to, you know, not just talk to the sports and try and get them to change, but to provide the evidence base. So there's always been a heavy interest in the research and the evidence base for in the charity, and that's mm -hmm. kept going. But the genesis was really that awareness of, you know, they were also teaching PE and that awareness of the inequality and the, the impact on girls not taking part in sport. They just felt it's just, you know, it's morally wrong, really, that girls are missing out so much. In terms of the focus back then, was it more on, the, obviously with them being kind of high-level players, was it a focus on access to elite sport or was it more kind of the grassroots or the, was it always both? So I guess one proceeds yeah, the other, they right? were, Yeah, they were elite players. And I'm, 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 I'm probably, I mean, I wasn't there, but it feels like it was always about the whole. There was an angle definitely and still is about supporting the women who are working in sport. And they, Anita went on to be senior player in the sports council as was. So there was always that focus on the, on the workforce in sport as well and supporting those women who had got into it. Uh, but it was very much about the whole interface between sport and women. It wasn't just elite, for sure. That had been a bit of, they both had been elite, although you say elite, of course, none of them were paid. I mean, there were virtually no, and it, obviously some men's sports to amateur at that point, but it wasn't, it didn't have that feel. It was always about this is wrong. We've got to support the women who are working in sport. We've got to support women into sport, but we need everyone to be participating. And Celia went on to be one of the early campaigners to to try and stop the abuse of children in sport and was involved with the FA very early on. So it was about children as well for her. The charity itself was, you know, about women and girls. I guess fast forward into today, hopefully it feels like progress has been made and I'm sure there's, there's a lot more to be achieved. But what would you say the, the distance travel has been so compared to back then to now? What's the kind of the main the main factor that you can point to say, right, this is this kind of feels like a change, a significant improvement if there is one that is yeah no exactly no there really has been and because i was in the vi environment sector before over 27 years or total i kind of draw a bit of an analogy between people dismissing it saying it's not an issue prove it's even an issue it moved on from that to you no know, okay it is an issue and we're in the point now where sport as a whole i think society in this country largely as a whole sees that women's sport 
does matter. And uh, the sports sector, you know, some parts of that have been doing phenomenal work to try to change the system. And obviously what we've seen in the last few years in terms of visibility of, for example, women's football has been really significant and netball actually a bit yeah. you know there's still not nearly enough coverage considering that before women were playing football netball was the biggest team sport by a huge margin but you're getting some mainstream coverage and and that really does make connect right down to the grassroots because it's what is normal for girls to do mm. you know that is what can affect the peer group attitude and if it's normal and a bit glamorous to be playing in these team sports then suddenly the peer group psyche shifts so that really matters so there has been gradual significant change in attitude in the sector and in the last few years in particular I think some visibility to that the sponsors are you know there's so many more companies now wanting to sponsor women's sport than there were and there was just one or two outliers and vitality was amongst them that was really sponsoring women's sport and now there's quite a clamor to it's seen as the thing to do now that doesn't mean that culture has caught up. So I think where we're at is the right languages out there, the right aims, there's recognition, but there's this huge tail, this whole wake of culture will take a lot longer to change. Yeah, I suppose it's easy for sponsors to, to maybe signal and just jump on board and say, this seems like the best thing to do rather than actually underlying how the organisations run, maybe. Yeah, and what surprised me actually coming into the sport world is that I could be a bit careful what I say, but there are a couple of sporting areas where participation is quite equal between men and women, but the culture is not at all conducive, you know, to, to women, despite that. And then yeah. there are sports where they may have been quite male-dominated, but culture, and now women are coming in, but culturally they're really inclusive, you know, and I put in that category, you know, things like the snow sports and, and the skateboarding or whatever, that mm. in, in my day, you know, girls were not really almost allowed to skateboard, they were, but very few did. And it feels like culturally the boys have been really keen to get the girls into some of those, I mean, can't say it's universal, but it's sort of a bit more open culturally. Yeah. And then, and then and other there are then other pockets where it has been the men's game where the resistance to change comes because it feels like something's being taken away from them so you know the the count the old guys around the county cricket boards or whatever they must have a sense of fear that they're going to lose something that's very dear to them if there's a huge change yeah and hence you know the hundred and things were just sort of bypassing some of that to get change anyway yeah i think it's things like like golf and things like that was historically not, <laughs> not allowed in the club etc i could see where they might be going to be they've got some fear but in overall though do you feel like i guess visibility and looking from the outside obviously in the mainstream it, there's there's a lot more awareness but i know you the work you do in the charity and studies and things like that that level like you mentioned before school level and teenage secondary school there's still a bit a big challenge there right for for girls and in terms of participation and, and dropout rates of PE etc no there really is and so our, the recent research we just put out this week was about some research we've done with teenage girls and the thing that the aspect that surprised us about most was not that they were dropping out past as boys which they were and kind of people know that but that 43% of those girls who were dropping out used to love sport. So we were talking about over a million girls around this country, teenage girls. So more than the population of Birmingham, around the same population of Birmingham, were dropping out, even though they used to love sport. So what's going on there? You know, and that is just a, what we're seeing with the research we do is there's this cumulative impact. So there's the sort of preschool, they're not learning the same skills. At primary school, their self-belief is declining. So self-belief mm. during primary years, the boys are staying equal. Would have been great if the boys had gone up, but it's staying equal. The girls, it's dropping down. And then they enter secondary school before they even got, you know, puberty and periods and all that stuff happening. They're entering it at a lower point. So then, you know, female puberty is a pretty brutal experience. So, you know, what, 12, 13 or whatever, and you're having to manage all this, blah, I don't know if you're too grisly, but, you know, you're just a kid. And then you might you might not have any advice about how to manage that for sport. That's really off-putting. Yeah. Not a surprise thing to say, but also not having the right sports bra, you know, just not having the right advice or the expectation that, of course, you will manage that. You will manage that. You can, you can manage that. And then you layer in that whole sort of social media stereotyping of how you're meant to look, how you're not meant to be sweaty, how you're meant to be dolled up to the nines constantly, you know, layer in all of that. So everything is pushing them away from taking part in sport. And the biggest gender gap is in participation in team sport with 23% gap, you know, 23% fewer girls and boys are, are engaged in team sport. And for me, that for us, you know, that is the way you maybe learn most life skills. 
because you're you know you're not just having to be great at your own with your own skill you're having to learn to communicate to lead to take risks on behalf of the whole team to accept on other people's muck up you know to mm. all the things you actually really need in life that's a really big factor and whilst there has been some improvement we did a survey a year or so ago about of people between the age of 13 and 25 I think it was around that so older kids younger adults and 60% of the boys were dreaming of reaching the top in sport and only 30% of the girls now I we didn't do a survey 10 years ago I reckon it would have been lower for girls 10 years ago. so that's yeah. even with the sort of coverage that we're getting now the girls aren't dreaming in the same way so despite this progress you know at the front end culture takes a long time to change and, and the culture within the school environment within the peer group, particularly with social media, is still meaning that girls are losing out. Yeah. I mean, I'm just thinking anecdotally myself. I mean, I'm, I'm from a family of women. I've got three, sister, three sisters, two daughters. So I'm kind of thinking about, I'm thinking about my, when you're talking, I think about my sister's experience. I never really talked to them about it, but thinking now, I remember them being really active and then just dropping away. Like they're active now and they, it's more for fitness, et cetera, and like recreational. But it's almost like that period, like you said, of maybe secondary school, and you go through, change in physique, et cetera. It's kind of, they just kind of opted out for a few years and didn't, and then maybe they got back in, maybe they don't. Whereas my experience mm. was, that was like me coming into my own as a, as a boy, man, et cetera. And you kind of sport, you could express yourself and everything was positive. So it's, yeah, I'm thinking about it now is really, I can see why it's such a challenge and I've got to think about <laughs> two little daughters to, to try and get a better plan or support them better, I think. Well, you're really key to that actually, mm. James, because what we found as well is the dad's attitude to their daughters is really, really important. So we've done a couple of things. I mean, we did this program called Daughters and Dads, which has come to an end, which is where we're getting dads and young girls, so sort of primary school age girls coming. So dads come with their daughters on a, on one evening of the week and they get separated. The dads get put in pink t-shirts and the girls get put in blue and then and they have quarter from hour just separately as groups where, you know, the girls are picked up and then the dads are basically introduced to what they're probably doing in terms of gender stereotyping you know are they using language like you look pretty you look beautiful are they worried that their girls will snap but they still chuck their boys around in the air that sort of thing and then and then they just do physical stuff together you know to kick a ball around or rough and tumble whatever it is and and from that we can see that a lot of the dads were quite emotional because the next day the little girls were coming in and hugging them in the morning when they'd never done that before because they had a proper physical relationship with their dad or they were getting time with their dad that their brother wouldn't let them normally have because the brother wanted to monopolize the dad mm. for playing football or whatever so the dad's role is really important and what we're seeing is that whilst half of mothers are encouraging their sons and their daughters equally to get into sport half of dads are encouraging their dads to get their sons to get into sport but only 30 percent of dads are encouraging daughters to. So mm. there's this big gap in the dad's attitude to their daughter in, in terms of sport. One difficulty I have is um our COVID's been difficult as well. So we my daughter's getting into all sorts of activities and sports to, to, and then kind of a two almost a two year kind of stop on everything happening. So confidence levels different, but I guess I'm always trying to think um more self-conscious around how I'm I guess how I'm communicating. So I feel like my experience of sport was on maybe a bit nervous to do this, et cetera. And it's almost like, you yeah, just get on with it kind of thing. But with my daughter, I'm kind of finding myself not being as just straightforward, like just have a go. I'm kind of like being a bit more sensitive, I think. And, and maybe to, you know, when really she just needs to do it because it's just confidence. Once you do it and you, you have, a, have a go, you come out the other side and you, you should be buzzing. It's, it's one of those things where if you don't try it, you don't know how, how good it is. So, well, you're t How old are your girls? So I've got a two-year-old and a, a five-year-old. No, I mean, that's it. your experience is what we're hearing from, from dads generally, and probably mums to an extent. I mean, if we come on to the mums' behaviour, we're finding out, but is that they're treating their daughters, even at the age you're talking about, as being more fragile than they would their sons, both emotionally and physically. So, you know, they're, they're more worried they'll upset their girls. And I think the backdrop to that is, had they been, you know, had you had sons, you'd be thinking, oh my God, if they don't get through this, they're going to not be one of the lads at school, you know? So you think it's really, really vital. Whereas with the girls, you think, well, I don't want to upset them. Plus it won't really matter. Mm. You know, now for you, probably you're not thinking it won't matter because you love sports. Yeah, I'm trying to work out a way I can get through this without tears. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. And that's the thing. But I think if you just, next time you're with them and that's the situation, just think what you would do if they were your son and, and always just apply that because that's the expectation they will. You know, if you think how much we're all influenced by the expectations others have of us, you're like, if, I mean, I remember at school, the teacher thought I was going to be naughty, I sure was, you know, because it's like, well, if you've got that attitude to me, I'll live up to it. And you do react to what people expect of you. So if you just kind of expect your kids, are gonna, your daughters are going to 
learn to do this, get through that, push themselves through that, fail a lot, but, but then learn it, then they will. You know, yeah. it's all about expectation. And so what the, the stereotype, the big thing about stereotypes is people fall into what's expected of them. And, and if we as when we're parents or the teachers, coaches, we have to be really, really conscious that we've grown up in that world. So we're all stereotyped like that too. You know, even us two talking now, we've got that sort of backdrop of having grown in a, grown up in worlds where, where that's the norm, you know. So yeah, we definitely. have to be constantly and, self-appraising, don't we? Yeah, and, and the fact that yeah, we enjoyed sport, we were good at it, is that's just like another level if another another factor. Kind of I'm conscious we haven't maybe given enough time to kind of what the charity looks like today and the different kind of facets of it and the work you're doing. Mm-hmm. Is it probably a good point to maybe just, I guess, run us through what the charity looks like at the moment and what's happening there? Yeah, so it's a small charity. The, the work that we've been talking about a lot, where I've been referring to what we understand about what girls and women are experiencing, is from our Insight team. So we have four staff in our Insight and Innovation team, led by um, Kate Nicholson, who comes from a Brand Insight for massive companies and but she's a passionate netball player and and her team really do the research work and understand we call it research but only a bit of it is quantified quantitative research most of it is qualitative so it's conversations really deep understanding in a, in a structured way and so there's a kind of core understanding we then want to make sure that we're getting messages out there so some of what we're doing is about pressing the problem still. The problem's different to how it was 30 years ago, but there's still a problem. And then people don't recognise that, then no one will do anything about it. So we have um, a small team here in communications and what we call engagement or fundraising. That there's only sort of four of them as well. And they're working to make sure we've got, you know, the right social media presence, we're pushing out the messages we need we need to be pushing out that we get we've got some great press coverage this week. And also bringing in the income we need to, to fund us. So, you know, we've got really good support from Sport England, but but also from other sources, from individuals who get some amazing challenge funding. We, we were, 18,000 was raised for us by the mothership with the four women who rode across the Atlantic oh, recently. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, some great challenge funding and so various things like that. And then the other team we call Policy Partnerships Public Affairs. And they're, again, a team of sort of four or five. That's where any projects we're running sit. So we've got a project running with Places Leisure at the moment called um, Big Sister, which is all about helping girls who've only recently gone through that teenage phase, help other girls to deal with it and stay active. And then also work on influencing government and parliament. So with our recent research we just seen yesterday in the Scottish Parliament, a Labour MSP stand up and talk about this issue of teenage girls dropping out and how we've got to crush gender stereotypes and provide the right provision. And so you know what policy calls have we got out there? We do, you know, we do think that we need to sort out, you know, the gritty end of things that girls are safe and women are safe in sport. Mm -hmm. So we're behind calls for an independent regulator for sport. We're involved in thinking about how we're going to press for gender budgeting so we can really test the government if it's putting millions, which it is, hundreds of millions of pounds into sport. How much of that is going to girls and women versus men and boys? Mm -hmm. Are they even counting? Why aren't they counting? How are they going to, you know, hold themselves up when women are paying taxes too, if actually all the money is going in? to men and boys so that side of things so it caused a bit of trouble there and then we're also do a lot of work with the sports sector in a collaborative way we've got great relationships with them to actually help them where they've got programs help coaches etc understand what they can do to help girls through some of these phases which they may not have lived through because the vast majority of coaches are men we need more women coaching we work with the female coaching network and others but you know there's no reason why a male coach can't learn to be brilliant supporting girls and women through all of those different things that they won't have experienced themselves so we work a lot with the sports sector and also on culture in the sports sector trying to to help get improvements to that and stand up for for women who are working in the sports sector does that uh, help uh, you understand uh, the charity <laughs> yeah so a lot going on and i think that that piece around coaching as well just understanding how how um looking at something from someone else's perspective especially like we talked about the girls going through that that change in um changing their bodies etc for a coach to or even teachers PE teachers etc to understand what's going on and, and maybe change their expectations accordingly or their approach with you know you touched on funding there and you got obviously support from like you said sport england etc is it generally how do you kind of fund the organization at the moment is it generally kind of those large backers or do you have any kind of commercial not commercial kind of fundraising operation opportunity 
opportunities that you, that you yeah we, we we love a good bit of corporate donation so we we have got this amazing core support from sport england which we've had in some form since the 1990s mm. and so you know full recognition for that so that's amazing i mean, never had that when i was in the environment sector but we also had some great corporate partnerships we're working with vitality at the moment on a three-year partnership um and there are a number of other you know csm live sponsor our podcast we've got so and there are various donations we've had from corporates which have been you know, incredible we've got a great relationship with Akai, the outdoor clothing brand for them and we've run two years now of bright friday on black friday and nice. they give us a percentage of their profits so that's been you know fabulous i'll probably forget one now there's probably some other great corporate relationships and then when we're doing work with different parts of the sector argent related for example who are redeveloping at brent cross and who developed king's cross we've got a really strong relationship with them and they're they're going to fund us to do some research in the Brent cross area and bonnet area looking at mothers and daughters because that's another key anchor the mother-daughter relationship so the corporate relationships um are quite varied with different sectors and, and really interesting and then we also bring in funding because we you know act as consultants effectively when people have got programs they want to develop they might ireland has been really enthusiastic sport ireland paid us to help them understand how teenage girls in ireland are interfacing with some of their sports like camogie and why they're dropping out gymnastics in such big numbers and so some of our work is on a consultancy basis as well we we love doing that with the right so the right guys who really want to change and we can yeah. we can help that yeah so not, not just a token effort to say yeah we could put your your logos on there for uh, this ambitions for the future currently are you, are you just operate in the uk i know this is an island there but is it generally UK wide or you work in the course, course yeah, of world or the partners? Yeah, I mean, we have been folks. We have um, sister bodies in the States. Billy Jean set up our, our sister body 10 years before us or so um, in the States and uh, in Australia and, and New Zealand and various other places. So we think our expertise and our insights into the lives of women and girls are relevant way beyond the UK. And, you know, so particularly the English speaking world, I think, you know, we could do, you know, more and more work on a probably mostly admission basis i suspect given the size of the charity but the experience with the republic of ireland has been great because it's it's introduced us to a different culture a more rural country a country where sport is in the community held in even higher regard i think for girls as well particularly team sport mm -hmm. and and so you've just seen slightly different aspects of culture towards it so we don't have ambitions to take over the world james we absolutely would be fascinated to do research in other countries should should there be interest there but there's still a lot to be done here of course definitely and, and um for yourself in your role obviously leading the organization do you have kind of what are your recurring challenges is it is it normally a comms uh, external communications challenge or, or what do you have that day in and day out for yourself in your role yeah, I mean, these chief exec roles in charities, whether it's a huge charity or a small one, you always have that interface with the trustees and the governments that you need to keep really on it. You need to keep a, a close eye on you know, making sure you've got all the right systems and all the finance and all the stuff behind that. And, and a lot of it, I've been in a couple of years now, is, is getting the right people in your team. Yeah. So making sure that you've got the right, you know, the right jobs are right people in those jobs and everyone operating well and effectively together and then yeah the external interface is important so during this week with international women's day and the need to be out there what we what i've done is a couple of panels with with which magazine for instance which question mark quite a magazine anymore and also you know with argent related and you know just reaching to different audiences so as a chief set it's really important that that's what i'm doing and i'm reaching to and forming strong relationships with other major charities like Polly Neat, who runs Shelter, is an old contact of mine because we were both in federal charities together and other ones. And she's passionate about the, the role sport plays in life. And, and so building up those external relationships or with MPs or peers so that what we understand and know about what needs to change is it's reaching out widely and it is not just kept within a very small number of people in the sports sector because the relevant you know in the end it's about what is the relevance of this to society at a time when teenage girls have got massive issues around anxiety depression self-harm eating disorders you know what are we doing making it difficult for them to experience sport which is such a great antidote to anxiety and some of those issues healthy body image etc in a situation where so many uh, women in later life suffer so much from osteoporosis but had they been 
super active teenagers and really building their bone strength, super active during midlife when they face menopause and they need to build their bone strength, they wouldn't be suffering that so much. So mm. some really serious health issues, really serious education issues. We know sport leads to you know better education attainment as well as being happier. So this is a really relevant issue for the whole of society and, and strong women are going to be a key component of creating a stronger world, actually, aren't they? I mean, you know, in this terrible situation in Europe at the moment, you want more strong women leaders, don't we? So, yeah, so it's really, you know, the chief exec job is about all of those things, that outward face, that making sure you're steering the charity, making sure you're in touch with the trustees, you know, they're getting their brains into the charity. Yeah, so it's that sort of red dot. So to, I was going to say to juggle all that, do you have anything, do you have any kind of, I guess, routines or habits or things you put in place to keep you working high performing and do you, are you still on the netball court and things like that? Does that, that kind of <laughs> your, your regular I wish, routine? I wish I was still on the netball court. Um, yeah, because I, I had that back thing, slightly went out of things like netball. But no, I think I, I try and obviously stay fit and well, do swim, do, do the odd exercise class. Wish I was doing a team sport still. That, that maybe will come because I've moved house during lockdown. I haven't really managed to engage in that. I think just staying, you know, making sure you're seeing friends. I, with me, I think it's just always trying to sort of step away so that I can see what's actually important yeah. and if you get too deep in you lose sight of perspective and perspective is the, the critical thing so you know if you step away enough then you see what really matters out of your list of a million things to do and you you intuitively will do the thing that matters most you don't have to put any um, charts in place you just intuitively know that's that's the critical thing at that time so keeping perspective in I always think in space and time so you kind of Step away when things might seem really huge and remember you're just this little person living this bit of England trying to do this thing. So if anything overwhelms you, that's what I would do. And then perspective in time. So you're thinking, you know, just trying to look ahead a few years and think, what will have really mattered now? You know, if I do this, that would have really mattered. I'll forget that I tidied up this particular detail but I won't yeah. forget that I reached out to that particular amazing person so it's sort of using that to try and kind of stimulate me yeah definitely I've heard that before in terms of like is this what you're working on now are you going to remember this next week that type of thing where it might be might feel like it's the it's the uh, the worst thing in the world or right really on top of you no I love that last question for me and I'm conscious of your time we always have a bit of a reflective question looking back so if you could go back to when you when you started out in your career maybe leaving university that type of time and give yourself one piece of advice what would you go back and tell your, your younger self I think I would say trust your instinct you know you're if you think something's probably a really good way forward you're probably right actually and don't listen to the detractors because I think that's probably the only thing that I could have really really made a bigger difference if I'd done is just really have more confidence in my instincts and for me that would mean having the right people endorsing that and maybe yeah. that's a weakness but for me if I don't have some great people around me say no you're absolutely spot on go for it then I find it much harder to believe I'm right yeah no I think it will get easier with age and I suppose as a young person it's hard to stand up for what you, what you think so no yeah. that's fantastic Stephanie thanks so much for your time I really appreciate you giving up all that for us and it's going to be a great episode no well great thanks for the opportunity and great to talk to you thank you for listening to this week's show you can subscribe anywhere you get your podcasts if you'd like to get in touch with us you can write to us at dryphase.podcast at coordinate.cloud, tweet us at coordinate sport, or follow us on Instagram at coordinate underscore sports, or on my account at james underscore ventures. This episode was produced by Nancy Kwamboka, with support from Claire Goodchild and Lola Small, with special thanks to Rochelle. I'm James Moore, and you've been listening to The Drive Phase from Coordinate Sports.